Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, as I said, my name is Howard. I am an alcoholic. Um, <clears throat> the uh, flyer for this group says that we do a, the group does a line by line study of the book. And so to be consistent with that, that's the way I like to start out the meeting is uh, to go through the book the way we do as as closely as possible is the way we do in the Big Book Comes Alive workshop, which meets every Sunday at five o'clock Eastern time. Um, the group has become so large that we really don't have any time for uh, question and answer and discussion. So we do that Monday at the same time. So join us tomorrow. I'm sorry, Sunday at five o'clock. The information's in the chat and come back Monday if you'd like to discuss and ask questions. Just send your email address to the big book study at AOL.com and we'll get you on the list to receive the handout material. We have a lot of printout stuff and you'll see that throughout the meeting today. If I put up anything today that you'd like a copy of, just ask for it. Send a request to the big book study at AOL.com and ask for the material on the step on the eighth and ninth steps that we discussed today. Um, <clears throat> that being the case, um, we're going to start on page 76. And uh, <clears throat> time doesn't allow me to go through all eight, nine pages of the eighth and ninth steps. So we're going to do a little bit of skipping. Uh, at the workshop, we don't do that. We go through every word, doesn't matter how long it takes. Uh, <clears throat> on page 64, <clears throat> Bill told us, and this is before taking the eighth and ninth step, he said that when the spiritual malady, <clears throat> excuse me, is overcome, we straighten out uh, mentally and physically. This book provides us with a pattern for living so that we can exist in harmony in those three basic dimensions, spiritual, mental, and physical. And I firmly believe that we, there are three basic dimensions of life. I think this book uh, repeats it over and over. Uh, there is a school of thought I know that says that there are two basic dimensions, and I'd be glad to have that discussion with anybody at any time, but just not now. It's not the time or place. But I firmly believe there are three basic dimensions, and I believe the book is consistent with that. And those are the three dimensions. And in step one, two, and three, we get right in the spiritual dimension. So when we get right physically, spiritually, we, we straighten out in the other areas. So in steps four, five, six, and seven, we get right with ourselves. We get right in the mental dimension. But we haven't done anything at that point to deal with that storage room on our shoulders that's filled with guilt and shame and remorse as a result of the harms we've done others over the years. And so we have to do something to deal with that. We've gotten right with ourselves and with God. And incidentally, when I say get right spiritually, it, you know, some people think, well, you, well, how could you get right spiritually in just three steps? What I mean by getting right is that our priorities are in line, meaning I'm here to do God's bidding. God is not my errand boy. For 24 years in recovery, I got up every morning and gave God his working orders. This is what I need you to do today. And at the end of every day, I checked that list because I always write these things down. And I pointed out how he didn't do the things I asked him to do. But my dad taught me to be fair. So we'll give you another shot tomorrow, God, and we'll do try that again. And that was my relationship with God, a very dysfunctional relationship. So I got right with God in the first three steps by recognizing the natural order of things. He's the director. He's the principal. He's the teacher. I am here to do his bidding. I'm a far cry from being spiritually fit, but I've gotten right in terms of the priorities here. And as I said, uh, in four, five, six, or seven, I got right mentally. And then I have to do something about this storage room up here that's caused by that guilt and shame. And uh, I'm not going to get right with the world unless I make restitution, unless I make peace with uh, the people that I've hurt and harmed. And, you know, I, I don't know anybody 
old timer, new timer, who comes into a room and takes a look at that awning that lists the 12 steps on the wall and reads that ninth step and says, gee, that sounds like fun. I can't wait to do that. But the situation is, how long can you go without doing it? Nobody looks at it and says, gee, that's a lot of fun. But believe me when I tell you, if you work the steps in order, by the time you finish the seventh step, you're ready for the eighth step. You're just ready to go with that. It's written in order for a purpose. We build a foundation of spiritual growth. So believe me when I tell you, when the time comes, you'll be ready to do it. You'll be ready. Um, <clears throat> and if we don't resolve this guilt and shame that we've been we're talking about, we're going to wind up reversing our growth. We're going to notice that we're starting to have trouble with personal relationships. That's the first sign to me. When I'm starting to unwind, my first problem is I'm starting to have trouble with personal relationships. And then after that, I start to realize I can't really control my emotional nature as well as I used to. And then I start to realize I'm prey to misery and depression. And if this starts to sound like familiar to you, it's that my life is going back to resembling what's on page 52, the bedevilments, rather than resembling what's on page 83 and 84, which are known as the ninth step promises. But if you've done the work up to page 82, they are not promises. They are observations of what your life is like having done those things, having worked the first nine steps. But like I said, if I don't continue to grow spiritually, I'm going to start to come apart. And the first warning sign for me is I start to have trouble with you people. So that's what I look for when I know I got to hunker down and do some work. So we're on page 76. And right in the middle of the page, Bill says, and I hope you have your books out, a pen, highlighter, hopefully a couple of highlighters. Now we need more action, without which we find that faith without works is dead. And that's a promise. I've highlighted that in our workshop. We highlight promises in, prayer, in prayers in pink. So that's in pink. And then Bill says something interesting. He says, let's look at steps eight and nine. Anyone notice that? Anyone notice that this is the first time he ever puts two steps together? Every other time, this is the first step in our recovery. This is step two. We have just taken step three. Every step is taken on its own. This is the one and only time that he puts these two steps together. And I don't know if anyone here ever thought about it, but that's the kind of stuff that keeps me up at night is wondering why these things are written the way they are in the book. I believe there are no coincidences here. I believe this book is divine in origin. So everything has significance. If he puts these two things together, there's a reason. And if you've wondered what the reason is, you're going to find out this morning before we're done. He says, uh, <clears throat> we have a list of all persons we have harmed and to whom we are willing to make amends. You may want to underline that word willing. Because you see, I think the eighth step is one of the most, well, let's just say maybe overlooked step, certainly misunderstood step. Most times if I go to a meeting and the topic is the eighth step, people are talking about making amends. That's not what the eighth step is about. The eighth step is not about making amends. The eighth step is about preparing to make amends. It's about becoming willing to make amends. Just like, <clears throat> excuse me, the sixth step gets us ready for the seventh step, and the third step gets us ready for the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh, and so on. The eighth step gets us ready to actually make the amends. So don't short, short, give short shrift to the eighth step. The eighth step tells us how to get ready to make the amends. And so he says that uh, we have a list. We made it when we took our inventory. So go back to your inventory, take out that notebook. And if you burned your inventory, you're in trouble. I don't know where that notion comes from, but it doesn't say it in the book. In fact, he tells us that those grids in our fourth step, that's our guide for living for the point, from this point on. In terms of working the steps, we need the information on those grids. So take out your fourth step inventory and look at the first column in each of your lists. 
the anger list, the fear list, the sex harms and the harms other than uh, sexual, because we want those names in the first column in those lists that we recognize we need to make amends to. And that's what Bill's referring to here. Get out your list, look at that first column and notice the ones that need to have amends made. He says, now we go to our fellows and repair the damage done in the past. Notice he doesn't say apologize. We're not going there to apologize. We're going there to repair the damage, to fix something. Uh, damage done in the past. We attempt to sweep away the debris which is accumulated out of our effort to live on self-will and run the show ourselves. How's that? We're not there to clear up misunderstandings and bad breaks or just bad luck. We're there because we have created debris as a result of our trying to run ourselves and everything else according to our will, not because of bad breaks and bad luck or other circumstances. Our troubles, we believe, are of our own making. And this next sentence is another prayer. Uh, if we haven't the will to do this, we ask until it comes. The this he's referring to is the actual going forth to make the amends. But we make a prayer in the eighth step. We get ready spiritually by asking God for help and direction. And we get ready logistically by sitting with our sponsor and figuring out the who, what, when, where, how, and why of making the amends. And I don't know about anyone else, but I've got, been to tons and tons of step meetings. And when they talk about the eighth step or the ninth step, they talk about their experience with making the amends. I have never been to a meeting where they actually told me how, how do you make the amends? How do I do these things? Well, that's one of the things that we stress in our workshops. We talk about the hows and we take it right out of the book. There isn't a thing I'm gonna to say today that isn't taken directly out of this book. And I like to use the index card method for uh, preparing to make my amends. So what I suggest people do is get a stack of uh, three by five cards or the four by six cards. And I thought I had some here, there you go four by six index cards or three by five cards rather, or four by six, either way, get a stack of index cards. What I'm gonna suggest is we do this. Let me put up the first screen share here. And this is uh, actually, let me take out my instructions for, these, for the eight step. The eight step says we made a list of all persons. You can see that, right? Okay. Uh, let me blow it up a little bit and then I'll shrink it as we go along. <clears throat> the eight step says we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. It's about preparation, becoming willing, getting ready and willing, spiritually prepar preparing and logistical preparation. Like I said, spiritual is asking God for help and logistical is sitting with our sponsor and figuring out these questions. Who? Start with who. So what I suggest you do is get that fourth step inventory out, get the names that you have to make amends to, and start. Take a, one of these index cards, and let me share this with you. Uh, where are we? Here we go. Take an index card, and in the left-hand corner of the front of the card, left-hand upper corner, write the name just the name of the person we're going to make the amends to. And then go on to the next card and just put the name down. So by the time we've done this for a few minutes, we've got a stack of cards that have nothing written on it, except in the upper left-hand corner, up in this corner, we have a name, just a name. So now we have answered the question of who. We now know who we get amends to. But let's go on. Let me put this back up. We also have to know, when do we make these amends? And I suggest that you divide your amends up into four categories. If you've got a lot of amends, there are some that you know you got to make right away. Those are the nows. Those are usually the immediate family members the mothers, the fathers, the husbands, the wives, the brothers, the sisters, those people who have lived with us 
and have <laughs> felt the lash of our alcoholism the worst. So those are the people that get called, that get amends made to them right away. So I use a symbol of plus. This little plus sign indicates now. And so next to, in the right-hand corner, the opposite corner of those cards, I put the plus sign. I'll make them now. If they're in the later category that I'm going to go get to after the immediate family, then I put a subtraction sign for later in the right-hand corner. And then maybe there are some, I'm not quite sure if I'm ready to do that yet. Those are the maybe. So I put a question mark in the right-hand corner. And then, then there are those SOBs who I will never, ever in a million years will you catch me making amends to those sons of bitches. Never going to happen. Pardon my French. And those people get a big fat exclamation point in the right-hand corner. Never going to happen. So if we have done this right, after a few minutes, we have cards that look like this. We have a name, and on the right-hand corner opposite it, we have either a plus for now, a subtraction sign for later, maybe, and never. So now we have the order of who we're going to make it to and what order we're going to make them in as well. But we also have to know a few other things. How about what? What are we going to say? What are we there to do? Well, use the index card and write bullet points. The reason why that you're here, bullet points. I've done this. I've stolen your trust, your love, this and that. I stole the car. I damaged, whatever it is. Whatever you're there to do, put a bullet point down. Because when you're sitting in front of that person, you may go blank and forget. So look down at your little three by five card. It's like a cheat sheet to remind you what to say. Then you've got to put down, how are you going to make the amends? You're there, you're telling them the amends that you want to make. Now, how are we going to make it? And then it's vitally important that you tell them why it's vitally important for us to do this. This is a life-saving, life-giving mission. Because there are some people who are going to say, no, no, you don't have to do that. Don't do that. It's not necessary. You didn't hurt me. Yes, I must do that. If I don't do that, I'm never going to overcome my alcoholism. And then with the help of our sponsor, with the help of our sponsor, after breaking them down, we then go forth and make appointments. We call these people up. We don't pounce on them in the parking lot. We don't call them up on the phone out of the blue. The step says direct amends, and the eighth, ninth step does. So we make direct amends, eye to eye, nose to nose. But we have to make an appointment to do that. So we call the person up, and we ask them for about 10 or 15 minutes of their time. And then when our sponsor agrees that we are ready, we go forth and we make the amends. But we have these cards set up that look something like this. Like I said, the name, then we have the order. Then we have the comments of why we're here and what we're going to do, tell them exactly how we're going to make the amends, and then quietly ask them a few questions and write down on the back of the card what they tell you. You're bound to forget it. Let them talk. We prepared. We knew what we were going to say when we got here. They didn't. This is their turn. And what do we have to ask them? Well, are there any other harms I've caused you? And listen silently. This isn't a debate. This isn't even a discussion. They're speaking. We're listening. And then we ask them, can you tell me how it made you feel? Remember, one of the questions we ask ourselves in the harms list is we put ourselves in their position. Did we unjustifiably arouse suspicion, jealousy, hatred, etc.? So we're going to ask them, how did it make you feel? And then the last question, is there anything else I can do to make this right? Remember, we thought well about it. We figure we know what the amends is, but maybe they have a totally different concept. Maybe they think that that's not enough. Maybe there's something else that needs to be done because in the end, they get to choose. It's not up to us. 
We're making amends to them. We're making it right to them. We're somehow trying to correct something we did to them. And they're the ones who are going to know best how to do that. So we ask them these questions. We write down on the back of the card what they say. And if they say something that, that you know, we need to do a little bit of thinking about, we tell them that. That's what I told one person, that I need a little bit of time to pray on this, to talk to my sponsor about it. I'd like the ability to do that and then call you up and come back and spend another few minutes discussing that. Do you think that's possible? I, don't, I can't imagine why anyone at that stage of the game would say no. But do not jump into it without preparation. Don't go off half cocked. You may make the situation worse, thinking you're going to make it better. You know, the, that, the, that better is the enemy of the best. You think you're making it better? Well, you're only going to make it worse if we don't strive for the best. And we have the best when we consult God and we consult our sponsor. So when you're throwing something like that, take a note and then come back. And then we go on to actually make the amends. And here's why I believe the eighth and ninth step are written together. As we make the amends, as we do the ones for now, it becomes easier to do the ones later. As we start making the amends to the later, it becomes much easier to make the amends to those people that we, I don't know, weren't so sure about the question marks. And I bet anyone here a fresh $20 bill or 20 euros, whatever you use, that by the time you're done with the maybes, you are ready to make amends to those nevers. So the point I'm trying to make is that the actual making the amends gets us ready to make other amends. There are some amends we're not ready to make, and we get ready by actually making some of the amends before that. If you think about that, that's why the eighth and ninth are together, is because we are getting ready to make some amends while we're making the other amends. Now, what Bill does in the book is he goes through a couple of examples of <clears throat> amends, different types of amends. And I, like I said, I don't have time to read through it all, but uh, let's try and hit on some of them. On page 76, the bottom paragraph, <clears throat> last three lines, it says, um, well, let me read the whole paragraph. Probably there are still some misgivings as we look over the list of business and acquaintances and friends we've hurt. We may feel diffident about going to some of them. Diffident just means uncertain. We're not sure about going to them on a spiritual basis. Last thing these people want to hear about is from us is God. So we got to be a little bit careful with this. Remember, these are people we've hurt. Don't get, don't put, let them get up on you on that basis. Don't kill your chances before you've said anything. So he's saying, let us be assured to some people we need not and probably should not emphasize the spiritual feature on the first approach. You know what the first approach is? I bet you thought that there's only one approach to making amends. The first approach is when you pick up the phone and make the appointment. That's the first approach. And we don't get heavy with a spiritual message when we do that. I just need about 10 or 15 minutes of your time. You think you could give me that? And then when we sit down with them and we're eye to eye, nose to nose, that's when we could say that, you know, I'm part of a, a, a spiritual program called Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm trying to live by these spiritual principles, two of which are honesty and restitution. And I'm here today to make amends for the harms that I've done to you. So we mention the spiritual features and the spiritual principles, but we don't beat them over the head with it. We don't get sanctimonious with them because that's not what we're here to do. We're not here to make matters worse. Uh, continuing on the top of page 77, here's a section that I think is so misunderstood. We might prejudice them. He says, at the moment, you may want to highlight these next one, two, three sentences. At the moment, we're trying to put our lives in order. The moment, right now, working on the eighth step preparation. We have just gone through the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh steps. What are those steps about but setting our lives in order, focusing on our defects, the nature of our shortcomings, 
the things that led to our downfall. That's what we focused on in those steps. But he says, but this is not an end in itself. And this next sentence is not only highlighted, but underlined. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. We don't do this work to become better people. We do this work to become better servants. And in so doing, we become better people. And the reason why I say I think this is very much misunderstood is because when people say this is a selfish program, very often this is the kind of stuff they refer to. Because the book says we're trying to set our lives in order, so we're focusing on us. It is not a selfish program. Up until this point, we're focusing on the natures of our wrongs. But now we begin to focus outward. We begin the process of going from self-centered to God-centered, to going from what's in it for me, what do I get out of it, why should I do it, to how can I help, what can I bring, how can I help you? We're beginning to turn that corner. We're not focusing on ourselves. You know that expression, we'll love you until you learn to love yourself? Ugh, that always makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. That is not what this is about. I hate to disappoint you, but it's not. We will love you until you learn to love somebody else. That's what it's about. I came in here being pretty narcissistic as it was. I don't need to make that worse. I need to learn how to give a damn about someone else. Most of my life, I was indifferent at best, indifferent to the welfare of others. I couldn't care less. My life is focused. My focus has changed to where my, that is the so central point of my life is helping others, intensively working with other people. That's a radical change in behavior. So that's my real purpose. I do this work so that I can be a better servant to be of service to God and the people about us. Um, let's, uh, I want to show you a couple other things because I'm running out of time here. And I want to highlight a few things that are so important. Um, let's turn to page 79. Middle of the page. Usually, however, other people are involved. We are not to be the hasty, foolish martyr who would needlessly sacrifice others to save himself from the alcoholic pit. We're talking about amends that could wind up harming us, say, maybe get sent to jail for something we've done. But we have to make amends for these things. But if we get sent to jail, what about the people who depend on us, our family? What about that? How, how are they going to make ends meet if we get thrown in jail? Because we sacrificed ourselves because I have to make this amends. Well, Bill tells us how to go about those things. If you turn to the next page, the very top paragraphs gives us specific directions about how to make amends when other people are involved. He says, before taking the drastic action, which might implicate other people, and this whole paragraph is highlighted. Here's number one. We secure their consent. If I'm going to go do something that's going to put my family in a bad situation, I have to get their consent. Notice it doesn't say we go to them and tell them what we're going to do. We secure their consent. Two, if we have obtained permission, we get that permission and then we, number two, consult with others. In other words, talk to your sponsor. First thing we do is get consent of the people who are going to be affected. Two, if we have the consent, then we talk to our sponsor. If we don't have the consent, we go no further. It ends right there. So we go to our sponsor, consult with others. And if he or she agrees that we need to do this, then we do the third step. We ask God to help with this drastic step. And then part four, we must not shrink. We go forth. Very clear instructions for how to deal with amends if it's going to hurt or affect other people. We secure their consent. We secure our sponsor's consent. We secure God's support. And if all of those pieces feel right, we go forth. We must not shrink. We make those amends. And what are the, the, the reasons? Why do we make amends in the first place? Well, it's not 
that we are liked. It's not so people would would, would respect us. Turn to back to page 77, the first paragraph, the last four lines tells us why we go to make these amends. But our man is sure to be impressed with it. Please underline this, a sincere desire to set right the wrong. There's the motive. That's why we set right the wrongs. That's why we're going there, not to be liked, not to be respected. We're there to clean our side of the street, to set right the wrong. So the motive in making amends is setting right the wrong. And then he says he's going to be more interested in a demonstration of goodwill. And there's the action we take. If we owe somebody money, we don't say, I'll start paying you $25 a week starting next week. <laughs> We've been doing that our whole life. We demonstrate goodwill. If I'm going to pay you $25 a week, here's the first installment right here. That's a demonstration of goodwill. Words aren't going to mean anything. We've done that before. <clears throat> and let me just show you this because I'm about to wrap up here and then turn it over to the rest of the people, the rest of you guys. But I want to just show you a couple other things here. Okay. You can see that, right? Here's the motive and the action. What's our motive? Sincere desire to set right the wrong. We don't go there to be accepted. We don't go there to be liked, rewarded, complimented. We're not there to tell them what they did. I had a particular amends that my sponsor wouldn't let me make for almost two years. Because every time I went to him with what I was going to say, he pointed out how my motive was wrong. One time my motive was, he said, sounds like you're trying to get him to hire you again, to give you your job back. You're not ready. Second time I went there, he said, now all you're doing is telling him the things he did wrong. You're not ready. When my desire is simply to set right the wrong, that I'm not there to be liked, accepted, rewarded, complimented, then my motives are pure. Remember the Oxford Group's four principles? The absolutes, the first one was absolute purity. That I am here for one reason and one reason only, set right the wrong. I mean what I say and I say what I mean. And the action, we demonstrate goodwill. If we're going to start paying back, we start paying back right here, right now. And I'm kind of running out of time and I don't want to eat into my, my guy's time. So I'm going to just <clears throat> take a step back. And if there is time at the end and we can ask questions, you can feel free to ask any, anything relating to that. But I'm going to turn it over. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.